Right. Let's just wait one more minute, Alan, okay? Okay. Lost Norm Kurtz. Okay. So, um, right. so good evening, everyone, and, and thank you for your for your time and taking the opportunity to to join us this this evening. This is the the last of of a four session class focusing on different aspects of um, the early the early kings uh, and the Levites a little bit as well. Uh, my purpose in choosing these stories, and by the way, we deliberately have asked Alan not to put the text up because the text is something I'll refer to and you can download it later on, but uh, this way I can see your faces. And if you have questions, if you just raise your hand, uh, the rule, there aren't any real rules here. We'll stop, Alan will unmute you and I'll have a chance to talk back and forth. Uh, I want to explain, but I want to explain a little bit but my purpose in choosing these texts and these stories. In, in the first place, these are great stories. And unfortunately, I don't think that our tradition has given them as much respect and do as, as they should be. I mean, you could come to shul every week for the whole, your whole life and, and never learn these stories. And these stories have a lot to teach us. And, and, and so what my goals are today is not just to talk a little bit about David and the relationships he had with his wives and his children, but also to share a, a way of looking at these texts so that I feel that you could maximize the enjoyment and the lessons that the chroniclers who put these stories into our holy text meant for us or hope for us to learn. So uh, we're gonna look at these stories from, well, I'm gonna provide certain kinds of points of interest so that we can look at this from how it was written, when it was written or when the incident allegedly occurred, uh, how it was interpreted by rabbis hundreds and hundreds of years later, why they chose these texts, why somebody chose these texts, or some groups of people chose to put these texts into the Tanakh. And, and finally, the question which, which I've always asked when I look at these texts and the Haftarot as well, is what can they possibly mean to us? Now, on the most basic level, these are great stories. If they're easy to read, they're funny, there's humor if you read this, but just like if you read the book of Esther and think of it as a soap opera like Search for Tomorrow, you can hear the author's message, you can see the characters and how they interact. You realize that there's, that there's, there's a message, but there's also humor, tremendous humor, and also tremendous insight into a world from, from long, long ago. So we're, ostensibly we're gonna talk about David and his sons today. And what I'd like to do is I'm gonna talk a little about each of his sons and, and the relationships he had with them or perhaps didn't have with them. Uh, all of these texts come from the books of Sam, first and second book of Samuel and the first book of Kings. Now, in order to understand our text, it's important to explain a little bit about the geography and the political relevance of Israel. And that is to say the north, the northern part of the country and the southern part of the country in the time of the kings. Our text assumes that David lived in the 10th century BCE. That roughly places him, uh, play, well, that roughly places Saul, his, his, his predecessor, at the beginning of the first Iron Age. At that time, according to archeologists, Jerusalem was a small, sparsely inhabited villages surrounded by a few impermanent settlements. Uh, that was it. It was, a, it was like Poughkeepsie is to New York. No, that's, that's, too, that's, that's too, too, too advanced, too sophisticated. It was like a little crossroads, first town, little place where people came back and forth, but there wasn't anything, real, there's no reason to go to Jerusalem. Uh, prior to David's conquest of Jerusalem, actually during his days as a bandit, and in the text we find out that when he fled from Saul, because Saul was trying to kill him, David became a bandit. And David, you know, he brought together uh, not exactly the most reputable of, of individuals, let's call them somewhat less than unsavory, and he formed them into a military troop, and he hired himself out as a mercenary. Um, to, to such an extent 
and he and he, he, he you know there's Mel Brooks has this line about Robin Hood and where where Carl Reiner says is it true that Robin Hood stole from the rich and gave to the poor, in which Mel Brooks answers no he robbed from everybody and kept everything. Well, that that's that was what David was doing. Now there's a what so he he worked for the Philistines at one point. He worked he he perhaps did some wonderful things, but he basically was the only person outside of the king who had a, had, a, had a military, who had, a, had an army. Uh, at one point, we actually have a letter from one of the Egyptian pharaohs to the then ruler of Jerusalem prior to David becoming king and, and moving his court to Jerusalem, uh, complaining that there, these robbers were stealing the food from his people and, and would the emperor, the pharaoh, send troops to, to, to defend his, his, these people because Jerusalem and the south of, south of Israel was more or less a satrap of, of, of Egypt at that point. Um, but, the, but the Pharaoh never did that. And one of the reasons why the Pharaohs rarely um, sent military expeditions outside of Egypt was because that if you were a, believed in the religion of the Pharaohs, and if you died on the wrong side of the Nile, you would not re get to be reborn and go to whatever heaven they believed in. So Egypt never really extended their military might too far away from, from the Nile. Okay. Now, during this period of time, a majority of the people lived in the north because it was more fertile and it was on the trade routes. However, this apparently changed in the eighth century, in other words, two centuries after David became king, because the northern kingdom had been conquered by the Assyrians and Judah had become an Assyrian uh, vassal or satrap. Now, let, let me explain a little bit about this before we get back to David. This was the time of the um, King Hezekiah. And if you've been to Jerusalem, you've been to this, this Siloam tunnel, the tunnel underneath Jerusalem, which you know, was a way out. Um, so what, what we have here, so let me talk about the Assyrians. So everybody thinks, oh, the Assyrian conquest, it like happened overnight. But that wasn't the case. The Assyrian conquest took decades. And what the Assyrians did is they would send an army into, at this point, let's say, northern Israel, and they would attack a town, control that town. And then they, what they would do was they would take half of the male population and move them into a suburb of, with, of their country. And they would leave half of their soldiers in that town to marry and integrate with the local inhabitants. It was a great way of expanding their empire and assimilating um, two communities. And this took, this took decades. And, and in the process when this was happening, because it happened, you can see it happening year after year, town after town, village after village. What happened is a, a number of people kind of got wise to this and they, begin to, they began to migrate south into another country. What country was that? In the country of Judah. Okay, like where, where Jerusalem was, okay. So, um, and that caused the problem, and we talked about this last week with the priests, because these two peoples from two different countries had a lot in common. I mean, for 200 years, the Northern Kingdom was separate from the Southern Kingdom. Uh, so you have Judah and Benjamin in the South and all the rest of the tribes in the North. And when the Assyrians finally conquered all of them, there goes that they're the 10 most tribes. But what, what happened? But they had a lot in common. They traded together. They had similar uh, similarities in religion. The first thing that uh, Rehoboam did when he uh, broke away from the, from the south and established the Northern Kingdom was to build two temples, you know, and to, to create a priesthood. And they had the same kinds of, most likely the same holidays. And they traded with one another. And probably like North Korea and South Korea today, there were families that were connected in both, in both places. So, this, was, this is what was going on in terms of the Assyrian, the Assyrian conquest. This was, oh, okay. all right. Now, because the North and the South probably traded, families probably existed in both countries. As I said, um, the Northern priests who had been servicing their people for 200 years migrated South as it describes the merchants. And by the way, a new industry, which was prevalent in the North and very successful, called the olive oil industry. It was during that time 
that the ballads of David and Solomon were probably written. In other words, 200 years after David um, most likely lived. It was before David's line was linked with the Messiah. Now that didn't occur to around 605, about 400 years after David lived. And it was around that time that the word Mashiach was linked to David. So let me just take a second and explain how David got, how this David got linked with the word Mashiach and Messiah, because it was already 400 years later. Uh, it happened when the then king of, of Israel, a man named Josiah, uh, who was, uh, well, Israel, in fact, he was a very successful king. I spoke about it last week. He created the festival, you know, his Passover. He uh, took the Levites. They created a civil servants, system of civil servants, and he moved them into the north to interpret the law. Uh, he centered religious worship in Jerusalem, and he fought for his, his, his king, his emperor, who was in Babylon. And at, 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 at um, but when once fighting for his, for his emperor, um, he received a, an arrow in the head and, and he died. Uh, he was killed at a town called Megiddo. Anybody ever been to Megiddo? I see hands, okay. A few centuries after that, the word was translated into Greek and the term Armageddon was born. This fa the fateful spot where the forces of good and evil will someday do, do battle and determine the fate of the world. It was at that point that, the word, that David became linked with the word Mashiach. Now, let's take a, go back to, to David and his children. Uh, I find it surprising that the Chronicler devotes six chapters to the story of Absalom. Now David had, the question was, why, why did he do this? Okay, I mean, this was when writing was, and the answer is, because at the point of David, the life of David, this was when writing was introduced. And we know that David and Solomon employed, well, let's just call them press agents. They had chroniclers who wrote their stories and transmitted their stories throughout the, the ancient world. This means that everything allegedly written prior to this time had to be transmitted orally. And as we learned when we studied the story of David and Goliath, most of these stories were organized in Babylon. When was that? Let's just look at it for a second. David lived 10th century, 200 years later. Um, the the, some of these things occurred. 400 years later, sometime in Babylon, 586, um, we find that the stories get recorded. Okay, and they come back in the form of, and actually by the time we get to the second and third century, when the Tanakh was finally put into its, most likely its, its most closely formal uh, uh, final form, we find the stories that we have in our, in, in our text. In other words, the process from when the story of David began until we get it to the time when we got it, took place over almost a thousand years. Now, following the death of Saul, David more or less, since he had the only army around, forced the southern tribes to accept him as their king. He then proceeds, as we talked about it in the first session, to eliminate almost all of the threats from Saul's family, and this is the time when the incidents of the time of Michal and Ritzpah occurred. And the Bible mentions that David had seven sons. Six were born in Hebron, and Solomon, the last one, was born in Jerusalem. And as it says in the text, and to David were sons were born in Hebron. The firstborn was Ammon, the second Kiliab of Abiagel, the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. We have this story where David goes out and he finds Nabal, he really likes her and he kills her husband. Uh, the third is Absalom, Absalom, uh, the daughter of King of Gesher, the fourth Adonijah, the fifth Shephtiah, and the sixth Yitram. And these are all found in the second book of Samuel, chapter three. And the notes are on the, can be downloaded later on. Now, in addition to his wives, he had Bathsheba, the last of his wives, 2 Samuel, chapter five, verse 13. And um, in addition to that, we're told that David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem, at least 10. So if there's a lesson which can be learned just from David's uh, virility, <laughs> I guess, it's spend less time in the office and do a better job parenting. Okay, now let's summarize David's family, at least the ones that we know of. We have the story of Ammon, his firstborn son, uh, the story of Absalom, David and Bathsheba. Now, by the way, David and Bathsheba had two children, 
The first son was born dead. And David saw it as a punishment for his killing of Uriah, the Hittite, um, Bathsheba's husband. And then he had Solomon. And finally, we have the story of Adonijah in the first book of Kings chapter, chapter one. Now, Absalom, um, Adonijah, the, the first son of, of, of David, excuse me, Ammon, the first son of David, we have a story where he defends his half-sister, Tamar, and after, uh, and um, anyway, he rapes her. And apparently Absalom was, was extremely close to, to his sister. He waited for two years, the, t- the text tells us, and then he took his revenge and arranged for Ammon's death. Apparently it couldn't, be, it couldn't have been covered up, and as a result, he fled into exile, leaving his father grieving. Now it's unclear who his father was grieving for. Um, because all the text says is, and David rent his garments and lay down on the ground. Was it for Ammon? Or was it for Absalom? Um, history says it was for Absalom, but we're not really clear. After several years of exile, and David's depression, because apparently after this he went into a huge depression, Joab, David's advisor, and his nephew, by the way, brought David and Absalom together. But the relationship never, never really healed. And over the next several years, Absalom prepared his rebellion. He aggressively developed popular support. It's a wonderful story, by the way. He sent messengers to the tribes, inviting, to, inviting them to his coordinate, coordination at Hebron. Again, Hebron is the key place. Hebron, by the way, when Solomon died and uh, his, his son wanted to be crowned in Jerusalem, the northern tribes wouldn't accept that and forced him to go to Hebron. Hebron is a very, very special place. Uh, So over the next several years, so he aggressively developed popular support and he sent messengers to the tribe, inviting them to his coronation. And and the text tells us in the book of Samuel, and he gathered an army and he administered justice. Now, all this was going on and, and David was still apparently in a depression because the text doesn't tell us that he was ever really lifted from this depression at all. Uh, and while well, well, Absalom be functioned as a king. Uh, and, so the, and so finally, at one point, Absalom created an army. And uh, his advisors, some of whom had left David and, and shifted over to follow Absalom, um, advised him that he should conquer Jerusalem. And he arranged and they advised him in the, to uh, take a thousand soldiers from each of the tribes. I guess that's... Uh, you know, those are the 12 tribes, and, and, and go in and to conquer Jerusalem, and while he's doing that, to sleep with David's wives and concubines, okay? And so um, David, when this starts to happen, and he sees the soldiers coming, he flees, okay? And he, he, he flees in, uh, with his entire household, except for 10 concubines who he left to mind the palace. And, the, and we're told the text tells us the whole countryside wept as the troops marched by. And the king moved into the valley of Kidron. David was completely unpre- completely unprepared. He um, hid in the wilderness, and he had to rely on food for his family and, and gifts to survive. He had just passed the summit of the Mount of Olives when the last descendant, a grandson of King Saul, who had um, physical problems so he couldn't be consider- considered as a king, showed up with, um, with donkeys and 200 loaves of bread and wine and cakes for him and for his household, and his name was Mephishobeset. And he said, here, this is for you. And David responds derisively, so you think your family will once again rule. So I think this is, again, very indicative of David. He had, he had a favorite son. He was unprepared. He was depressed. And he was always threatened by the descendants of Saul. He still felt he had to hang on to his presidency. Uh, all right, so this is kind of what happened. So, but, but the time, but what happened was the the tide turned, and David was able to outwit Absalom, and Absalom uh, fled. And the story tells us that he fled on a donkey. And by the way, he's, we're told that Absalom had a beautiful crown crown of hair. And while fleeing on the donkey, apparently his hair got caught in a tree, and he couldn't release himself. Now, really, how fast do you think a donkey goes? I mean, really, if I was going to be riding, we've also seen the movies, right? 
somebody's riding on a horse, they're riding really fast, there's a branch, they hit the branch, they fall down, but a donkey? Come on, this is clear, clearly, I mean, what kind of a story is this? Anyway, um, so the text tells us, as the mule passed under a great terebinth tree, his hair became entangled with its briars and left him stuck between heaven and earth. And Joab, David's nephew, and his general finishes the job. And David never forgave him. What does David say? Is my boy safe? Is my boy safe? He went to the upper chamber and wept, moaning these words as he went. My son, Absalom, oh my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died for you instead of you. So this is just a, a, a remarkable kind of romantic, loving story. But let's, let's kind of look at this from a, different, from a different perspective for a second. Because I got to tell you, this lesson wasn't designed to challenge or destroy anyone's understanding of our sacred texts but to provide us with a more sophisticated understanding of the process and the wisdom which has allowed us to continue to develop as a people. A people who strive to embody an ever last, ever developing, maturing concept of holiness. The chroniclers in the Chumash and the books that follow with the possible exception of the books of Chronicles, the last two books in the text, attempt to show us that everyone, kings, queens, and prophets were men and women who were less than perfect. Studying these stories te teaches us about their strength and strengths and their weakness so that we can think about our strengths and our, and our weaknesses. These stories and legends, and they are legends of the past, um, they kind of link us to a special place and to teachings which strive to impress upon us specific values and ideals. Now, let me finally, I want to respond to a, a question that many people have asked me in, in my uh, rather lengthy, lengthy career. Um, I've been asked this more times than, David, than David's dalliances. Why approach the text from a historical point of view if it's so obviously ahistorical? And, and the answer dates back to, um, to my time as a freshman at college at the University of Wisconsin, where I was a history major. And one evening I attended a lecture by Richard Rubenstein, the author of a book um, then called After Auschwitz. And, and the lecture destroyed my understanding of, of Judaism, or the Judaism I had learned in Hebrew school. He called the stories of the patriarchs and the matriarchs myths. And he tore those myths apart. And he actually replaced those stories with historical and archeological facts. And all of a sudden Judaism began to make sense. And it changed my life. It started me on a trajectory which led me to the rabbinate and to a way of thinking and teaching that brought us to this day. I studied Jewish history and I found when Judaism was explained from a historical context, it strengthened people's identities. And um, I, I hope that you found that uh, that message and the way I try to do this, you know, a, a worthwhile a worthwhile um, experience. Uh, I've given you a lot, I really have given you a lot um, about why these stories are there, about who wrote these stories, about when these stories were written, and perhaps what the meanings of these stories can possibly have for those of us who, who look into it, um, if you have. So I thank you, and if you have any questions, I can certainly take them. Yes. Everyone, everyone's unmuted now. Okay. Uh, just raise your hand so we can acknowledge it in that case. Okay, Ron. A uh, couple of questions. <clears throat> Sounds like an episode of a season of Sopranos, for one thing. <laughs> the concept of, of uh, Mashiach Messiah that we have now, uh, how was that? Was that the same concept they had in 800 or 1000 BCE? Or what, what was their concept of Mashiach? Concept of Mashiach, you said? Yeah. They, didn't have, they didn't have a concept of Mashiach until about 600. Well, okay. what was that concept? Was it the same as ours? Was it a different concept? What was the evolution? Well, we're not, we're not sure what their concept was, but we do know that by the time we get to the early stages of the Talmud, that the Talmud has many different understandings of it. They say that uh, the Messiah will come when everything is terrible or everything is great. There was, and then 1600 years later, that we, there was um, Isaac of Lori who said, if we live a certain way, we can bring the Messiah. 
you know, to earth, and, you know, and, and changed and changed the world. What what uh, what Messiah do? Well, that's the, the, no one really knows. Um, <laughs> either we have to, it's either we have to be totally perfect, or it'll bring us into a time of um, of, of peace in the world, according to the Maimonides, where only two two books will be studied, um, the Book of Esther, because it teaches Jews how to live in a non-Jewish world. And I believe the other book was the, in the Humash. I believe that I might be wrong on the second one. So we, 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 it's a very undefined, undefined topic. And it, as we became more fundamentalistic, it became more narrowed as like what we have today. If it, they didn't, they didn't, they, the rabbis didn't um, discuss, is it a man or an age? You know, and in, in other words, is it a period of enlightenment or is it just a human being? And, and of course, uh, we, we couldn't answer that. Gary? It appears to me that um, David had a rather tumultuous life. And being a leader, I'm trying to figure out how we today can extract out of some of the leaders that we had in, in, in our, in our uh, history, uh, how, how, how come we don't have, we, we have a lot of chaos in our, and is that part of the history that we have? Um, he, he, he didn't know whether he was coming or was going. He, he you know, he was, was a, a, I understand, a womanizer. Um, and I, I just don't understand why God would create this kind of a history. Um, I, I mean, maybe that's... Oh, so, okay, so let me say two things. First place, it, with the, the chronicler, the people who put these stories together, who lived through these and publicized it, um, these stories were, were carried on and in Babylon... Because the goal in Babylon was to, for us to return to, to the Holy Land and to be united as a people. A lot of the stories in the, in the, in the text, in the Chumash and in the books of Samuel, Joshua, Judge, and Samuel and Kings, were shaped to reinforce the centrality of Israel and Jerusalem, us being a people who are going to go back. So that's, that's kind of why a lot of these stories are there. Uh, you said something else, which I wanted to respond to, and I'm not sure exactly. I forgot what it was. So maybe well, 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 basically, uh, it doesn't appear that we're we're, we're shown significant leadership by people who who we we think are the leaders that have have laid down the foundation for our futures. Okay, so um, that's that's the beauty of our text. The beauty of our text is that these there, that leadership is. Everybody has, has, has failings and his weaknesses and his strengths. And our job is to interpret those strengths, to understand them, and try to figure out how we can avoid those kind of issues themselves. David specifically, but I, and this is my take, by the way. So when we first find David, according to the people who wrote down the story, he was this, this, this naive little kid who had a vision of being, you know, that God was gonna take care of him and he was a, a shepherd and going to take care of his people. And he had this really true vision, and to a great extent, he, he succeeded. However, as his life progressed, and he, he, and he transitioned from a son and a simple shepherd to a ruler of human beings, and eventually to a king, his life changed, and he had to deal, with, and his circumstances changed, and he had to deal with all kinds of things. And I think that, and that impacted upon him, like it impacts upon all of us. And I think it tainted him, and what we see then is, he wasn't an ideal leader, he had a dream of who he wanted to be, but maybe he didn't end up that, but he didn't end up that way. He ended up being a person who didn't plan, um, a great general, but a lousy parent, and not such a great general after he got secure. Um, think about all of us when we started out and we, when, you know, in, in going into college or whatever place we were going to go. We knew who we wanted to be and how he wanted to live. You know, but life got complicated. You know, some of us married. It was a good marriage. It wasn't such a good marriage. We had children, they were great kids or they weren't great kids. Our jobs didn't work out. Different kinds of things happened. That's, that's the game. And that's, the, and that's, I think, the message from those stories. Yes, I see Bob Fogel. Yeah. So Solomon is a great king, Solomon the wise, Solomon, David's son. And then he goes off and gets himself 700 wives and um, worships other gods, or at least allows other gods to be worshipped, and we gloss over that. And and what? We gloss over Solomon's 700 non-Jewish wives. Right. 
and, and the idol worshiping that went on under his watch. Um, I, I studied this recently with some friends and they were flabbergasted to find that this was who Solomon was and said, why, why is it that we revere him so? And, and I think that we need to think about our ability to ignore the flashes. For those people who aren't speaking, please mute yourself. Okay, now try it. So you're asking again, Robert? Okay, so, so when we think of Solomon, most, most of the time, think of Solomon as a great king, we think of the story of you know, dividing the baby and, and other, other tasks of wisdom, the wisdom books that he wrote. And we gloss over the end of his life where he had 700 or 700 or 1,000 non-Jewish wives and allowed idol worship in the temple. Okay. And, and so we have this ability to gloss over these things, even though they're very clearly in the text. It's not, you know, it's not hidden. It's not like it's not there. It is there. Right. And we don't we don't treat that. We treat, hey, Solomon was a great king. Right. If you read if you read this and the rest of them. Right. If you read this the story of how Solomon closely, you realize that he bankrupted um, the country. He had to give away cities in order to pay his bills. Um, you know. But this is this is a, this is again this is the chroniclers who were trying to trace the Davidic line, the line of David, because David the line of David because God loved David more than anybody, and it, from the and and. Out of David will come messianic times, and you have, these are wonderful folk tales that were put together and, you know, and, and written or told for two hundred years, and then finally put down in writing um, because Solomon and just like his uh, David, his father, um, were the first person who actually hired people to write their stories. You know, I I, I hear what you're saying, but, but but my point is a different one. Okay. It's about us. It's not about the Chronicles, and it's not about David, and it's not about Solomon. Uh -huh. Our view of Solomon, for the most part, is great king. Okay, without really dealing with no. how much he bankrupted the kingdom, no. and and had you know, and 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 for, for the guy that was going to really walk in God's ways, didn't so much do it. The guy okay. that was supposed to have a hundred horses to have a thousand wives, um, to build. Um, for his, his, you know, I'm, I'm going to let Michael, that, Robert, I'm, I'm going to let Michael Frelick respond to you. Mm -hmm. I was just going to suggest you might want to tell him about Josiah mm -hmm. and how, what he did to these uh, campfire stories. Well, well, then that's another, another class. I could do it, but I know. I did the best I could, Robert. I hope it answers. Stu. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it strikes me. When we have these stories in Samuel and Kings, they are realistic. I mean, whether leaving aside historical, they are realistic as far as the depiction of the people. They're even made bigger than life, but all the flaws are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we still have a line of David, even in Babylon. We right. still have, you know, essentially we're waiting for the return of the king to Gondor to Jerusalem. And right. it's only after we've, at least we have lost track of the line of David. After Zerubbabel is gone, we have no, we don't know of any actual linear descendants, father to son, of the line of David. Then we get Chronicles, about 400 or whatever BCE, and then all the, a lot of the warts are removed, and they're given a big cleanup story, and everything is brought to emphasize the line of David is the center, even to, even to downplay Sinai. It's about da the line of David. It's about Jerusalem. Right. So if anything, we're, we're, we're saying, why do we like these earlier stories? I think it's amazing we even have them, because they do have they have this, you know, feeling they're not just the, uh, the the PR department, but they're actually telling, you know, stories about all these very flawed people. That's right. I mean, even go, even going back to Sa Samuel's about as gets about as good a picture as anybody, and even gets to complain. You want a king, Gavin? I done a good job. He whines a little bit at the end, but all the rest have a lot of flaws, and and, and it's brought out in them. Right. That's true. Um... Uh, did I see any other hands? Okay. Well, thank you guys and um, have a great evening. All right, wait, don't, don't, wait, don't, don't run away yet. Okay. <laughs> okay, I do want to get a uh, survey, so to speak, of the people here. Uh, Chuck had asked me to uh, ask of you what uh, topics you are interested in to, to, be, to have him talk about in a prop, maybe another series in the future.
So what kind of issues would you like to hear about or what kind of topics are you uh, interested in? Um, Ron. Uh, the archaeological evidence uh, versus the historical and the Talmudic evidence. I mean, putting this all together like you're doing right now. <laughs> okay, well, actually, um, I, I've been playing with an idea, which maybe in a three or four weeks I'd be glad to do, um, based on, even though it's not part of the calendar year, um, I'd like to, I could, would like to do a class on the book of Jonah, uh, which I find that um, if, you read the, if you read the early church fathers and you read the Koran, they have some very interesting things to say about Jonah. And, um, and, and Jonah is a, you know, we, and the real question I had, which is what we start to research this and think about it, was why are we reading the Haftorah of Jonah and Mincha and Yom Kippur? How and why did it get there? And, and so I've actually spent a lot of time um, thinking about that. And I, come, I, have, a, I have a theory. <laughs> it might be wrong, but it's my theory, um, which I'd like to use as an example to... Uh, Try to explain the story of Jonah, and if uh, even if it's if I'm slightly incorrect, you'll know more than your rabbis. Um, but I'd like to do that at some future time, if possible. Okay. Uh, it sounds good. Can you hear me? No. Yes, Richard, I hear you. Okay, so I'm Rick London. I'm in Milwaukee, and I think I got I'm Zoom bombing you guys. For, um, I got a link from um, the men's club. That's right. That sound right. And where are you? <laughs> Who are these people? Alan, why don't you, Alan's the vice president. Why doesn't he tell you? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, we are the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. We are an organization of over 200 clubs throughout uh, North America, and in fact, uh, the world, uh, representing uh, approximately 18,000 men. Uh, sure. We do all kinds of different things, but as you see right now, we're doing these webinars since our people, of course, are stuck at home. My guess is that you received this because it was sent to one of our members who then forwarded perhaps on to you. Does that sound, sound right? Right. So I'm a member of the men's club of my congregation. Okay. Oh, you are. Okay. Very good. Okay. And um, that's, how that's, that's how I got it. Okay. And where are you all? It sounds like you fellows know each other. Uh, um, some some no. yes, some no. Some too. Okay. At all. Uh, I'm a vice, I'm a current, uh, one of the vice presidents currently, and, and uh, Jerry Agrist is a, is a former international president. Norm Kurtz is a former international president. Evelyn, uh, son, Evelyn belongs to Park Avenue Synagogue in Manhattan. Yeah. You know, so, and uh, United Kurtz, Synagogue also receives this list. So we're all- Les Agassin. Oh. Okay. okay. Les, Les Agassin submitted it. Okay. So, so um, let me just tell you, I, I really enjoyed it. I dropped in last week and uh, I, I thought it was, both sessions were terrific, brief, digestible information. Um, and my comment on, on today's or tonight's, um, recently I read Yoki Brandis's book, The Third Book of Kings. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's, uh, a novel, historic novel, that uh, touches on some of these issues, and it, it's really interesting. Oh, I'll look into it. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Norm. Thank uh, you, Richard. Appreciate that. Norm. Chuck, I love these sessions. You know I always do, but I'm going to go in a different direction, and you'll probably reject it and say, no, you don't want to talk. <laughs> but um, every time I see your name come up, I am eager to hear your slant on our current use of technology <laughs> and and where you think that came from and where do you think it's going to go. We've talked about technology on Shabbat many, many times. Uh, we see how the Orthodox and the, and the more liberal streams are responding to technology today. Our synagogues are now deep in conversation about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and the spiltest that they're feeling about how we're going to give spiritual meaning to those holidays dealing with what we're dealing with. And I would love you to spend a half an hour uh, to oh, talk about that. That's, if that's you're at all 
Well, I'd be glad to have a conversation with anybody who wants to. This actually, so I received a call today. I never thought I would be doing this at this point in my life, but um, from from a former congregational president and a former Kerub consultant um, who was, had some issues with his his rabbi. Not that everybody. That I'm sure that no one ever has issues with their rabbis. Never, but, never. But, oh. but but his his concern is how are we, you know, his. His rabbi was all around doing all these things internationally and all this other kind of stuff. And they brought in all these new members. And um, when the virus hit, he's home with three kids and he's not doing very much. And the question was, so what should we be doing in this, in this kind of format? I think, you know, I think this is really going to, you know, force synagogues to change dramatically. And right. the world that we know is not going to, not going to be there. And I've, uh, the, the way it was and the whole, I mean, I've, I have several colleagues, who I've heard from recently who are having their salaries cut because they they don't the congregation doesn't think that they can sustain it with the virtual membership. And and, and so I, I think that it's time for a kind of a rethinking of how we reach out and reach in to different generations using these kinds of medias. I don't think there's any substitute for you know for personal contact. You know me. Right. But sure. uh, but, it, but when there isn't sufficient you know, personal contact, I think we need to think about these things in a dramatically different way. And I um, be more than glad to share it with anybody that wants to call me or talk about it. Well, you were asking How Alan for and I'm, I'm just throwing that out as a suggestion. Yeah. In I'm addition not, to and not in lieu of these great historical... Yeah, I'm, not, I'm, not so, I'm not so certain that I'm the best person to, to respond to that other that, that kind of way, but um, we can think about it. I'll think about it. Your opinion is always valuable to us. Okay. Sure. I would call that Judaism post-COVID. Mm -hmm. Rabbi? <laughs> Rabbi? Yes. When you take a look at Job, Marvin Fox always suggested that that was the favorite book of Immanuel Kant, and he, uh, and he modeled the critique of practical reason on it. I see that. You know, I wanted to try working on Daniel, but I found it was too sophisticated for me in one session to do in one session. But uh, maybe another time also. Okay. Well, listen. Thank you very much. Have a great night, and I thank appreciate you very your much. Time. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you for participating, folks. Thank you, Alan, for organizing. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Alan. We look forward to seeing the rabbi's next series. So I'm hey, twisting. Well. I'm twisting your arm technologically. Well, I think um, some maybe Jonah in a couple of weeks. Maybe when we get into early June. Okay, okay that's fine. Okay, Great. my evenings are pretty full these days. Well, they extended oh, lockdown in Virginia a few more weeks, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>